What's up, everybody? Time to kick your weekend off right. It's Friday, high noon. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. I have been on a fitness kick for years, probably like seven to eight years, really hard. But lately on the show, there's been an emphasis on fitness, especially during COVID, because it's a huge part of what is going to be human recovery. And we're going to continue on that kick today. Before I bring on my first guest, I'm going to give you the message of the week. As many of you know, I have trained martial arts and taught martial arts for several years. And one of the constant messages that was shared and uttered in the martial arts school that I uh, train and teach at San Dojo is that the training is 75% mental, 25% physical, which is an odd scenario, right? Martial arts is always a metaphor for life. That's always the way I've understood it. What you see on the surface level is a bunch of people working their asses off, sweating very hard. It looks like, wow, that's very physical. Like that whole training is physical. Imagine that's only a quarter of it. The way a wave crest, you see only half of it. The depth of what fitness and martial arts can offer you upstairs in the noggin could be three times that. And you just don't see it. It's one of the added benefits that I got from martial arts training. I just thought I was going to come in and learn self-defense and get stronger and get faster. And this whole other thing was offered to me. And it has helped me remarkably. I've said many times I would have burned my brick and mortar places to the ground a hundred times over if I would not have had martial arts training and gained that mental fortitude. With that, I would like to introduce my first guest. We're zooming in to DC in the Northern Virginia area. His name is Nick Lozano. He is a veteran podcast host and producer. He is also a technology consultant. Welcome to the show, Nick. How you doing, Jeremiah? Awesome. What's going on? Nothing much, you know, just uh, trying to survive in this uh, current world we live in, like I'm sure everybody else, you know, switching from being out in the city, working downtown to working at home and trying to you know, balance that mix with uh, family time and work-life integration, I guess, as you say. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's going to be the focus of today's show for sure. And and Nick here uh, is also a jujitsu practitioner. He's been training for about five years as well in the Northern Virginia, D.C. area. And, and that's really what it's all about, right? It's about survival. It's about staying in the game so that you can party one more day, right? <laughs> whether, whether it's jujitsu or, uh, or business. Uh, why don't you give everybody a little bit of, a, of your, your business? We'll get to, the, to, to jiu-jitsu and, sure. and training a little later, but your, your business background, uh, you know, where, you, where you studied, what you studied, kind of like, give us your resume. Where, I've got a couple scouts on there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my business background, um, initially I worked in uh, the restaurant industry, you know, as a professional chef for probably about eight years. Um, so that one, well. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> I got tired of working every single weekend and every single evening, which I'm sure, you know, yeah, um, yeah. just tried to decided to do something different. You know, I always had this interest in technology. Um, I'm probably the only kid who was eight years old reading the windows 3.1 manual. Um, <laughs> I don't know many kids who actually do that. Um, so then in college, you know, I just shifted over to technology. Uh, what I really love about technology is it's just this ability to constantly be learning. Um, it's, it's changing at such a rapid pace that you always have to be learning. And that's what really drew me towards it. Um, so my day job, I run technology for um, an insurance trade association here in DC. I also have my own uh, technology consulting company where I help small to medium sized businesses, you know, get their infrastructure up to uh, par, maybe bring it up to that next level. And then, like you said, I'm also a podcast 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 host <laughs> are you nervous um, no, I'm i am not nervous for some reason i just cannot talk this morning i don't know why <laughs> i it happens to me too i'm just like so comfortable and like my tongue is just like blah, 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 like mush mouth yeah i think you know it's that it's that my mind is going faster than my mouth is yeah and yeah tripping over the words yep i get that a lot uh give us a little background on your podcast history because you you ran and produced uh, podcasts for other companies prior to hosting your own, correct? Yeah, correct. So I initially got into podcasting, just running it for my day job. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they were just doing little sound bites every now and then during meetings and probably about 2014 or 2015, we decided that, you know, hey, everyone's doing a podcast. Um, Joe Rogan's getting humongous, yeah. um, you know, and he's even bigger now than he was then. 
So they were just like, hey, you know, you did some kind of music before. Uh, can you just put this thing together? And it's just me being a technologist and my inherently curious nature. I'm like, I can probably figure out how to do that. I mean, what's what's hard about plugging a microphone into a mixer and, and recording it? Uh, so that's where I kind of got my start. And my podcast is called Lead.exe, and we explore leadership from a technology leader's perspective. Uh, what I find in my time talking with technology leaders is they spend a lot of time working on, we'll call them your hard skills, right? Your technical skills. They learn mm. what the new AWS is, what the new computer language is, you know, what the new security measures are, but they don't spend as much time talking about the soft skills, or I like to call them essential skills, which is like your emotional intelligence, your self-awareness, um, you know, your servant leadership. So we try to bring topics like that to the forefront for them to expose them to new and different ideas. And you have a co-host on that show as well, correct? I do. Uh, I, I share the uh, hosting responsibilities with my co-host, Brian Comerford. Um, you know, he's based in Denver, Colorado, and we do it just the same way here. We're, we're, we sit down on oh, Zoom wow. and we bring guests in and we do everything remotely. And what I really love about podcasting is it's really brought my network forward. And I'm able to talk to people that I normally wouldn't get access to. The, the joke I always like to give to people, it's like, hey, can I pick your brain and buy you coffee? And people don't reply to you. But it's like, hey, you want to be a guest <laughs> on my podcast? They're like, sure. And they reply instantly, <laughs> right? Which which I'm sure you have found the same situations. Yeah, absolutely. It's strange. And it's funny. Are, are you familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk? Yes, I am. Yeah. yeah. So that that's that's kind of where the, the idea first got planted in my head. Um, you know, running brick and mortar businesses, it wasn't so hard to get, like, I would just invite people to my restaurant, you know, I'd be like, come in and let me buy you, a, you know, a drink or a meal. And it's, it's kind of a fancy place. So they were like, oh yeah, that's not a problem. But, but like to expand that reach, you know, he was talking about that, whatever. It was like a year and a half ago when I, when I first kind of like reacclimated myself with him. Um, and, and I was like, that's a good idea. I'll try that. And it totally works. It's like 100%. <laughs> people are like, who doesn't want to be in the spotlight, you know? Yeah, I know. And it's, it's great that you dope. bring up Gary V because initially when I first saw him, he just put me off. I mean, oh yeah, he was like brash and yeah, he's like yeah. cursing uh, and Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he is, it, he has that certain type of personality that can rub people the wrong way. And initially yeah, I, I, yeah. you know, I, I tuned him out because he was just way too much over the top. And I thought he was just trying to get people to listen to him. But as more as I saw him on LinkedIn and you know, as well as I know, the internet follows you around. So instantly I watched one of his videos and then, you know, Facebook and you're, Google you're start recommending everything it. to me <laughs> yeah, about yeah. him. And then I started listening to his message and, and that's what kind of drove me further in getting into, I guess, this social media presence. I was doing my mm. podcast and I was failing at what I feel like a lot of podcasters fail at is the promotional side, right? Yeah. It's putting the podcast together, editing it, everything. That's the easy part, talking to exactly. guests. The hard part is actually making the media and producing it. You know, if you just build it, nobody's going to listen. I mean, you, yeah. you've got to drive people somehow. <laughs> and that's what really drove me to social media and, and Gary Vanderchuk. It's just, you know, you've got to at least toot your horn a little bit and get out yeah. there and say, Hey, I've got this, you know, why don't you have a listen? And, you know, there is a dichotomy of balance to that. You can't, you know, do that 24 seven, people aren't mm. going to listen to you. But you need to be out there and at least doing that, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's true of all business, but I, I really learned a lot about it in, in this format. And it was the same for me, um, where like, not, it's like getting to this point, you know, where we're sitting down and talking, I'm like, oh, I can relax now. I'm just like doing all this work all week. Like it's pre-promotion for the upcoming show. And as soon as that show is done, I'm doing post-promotion for it. And that phases right into the pre-promotion for the next week especially like we're doing it every Friday. So we're constantly cranking them out. Um, it's funny you talking about like your first introduction to Gary Vee. I first got into him in like 2007 when he was doing wine library. TV. Wine library, yeah. Because I was selling, I was working in the city. I was selling a gang of wine. And one of my friends was like, yo, you're going to love this guy. Just check him out. And like instantly I was like, this guy is amazing. And my wife was like, the sound of his voice hurts my ears like, <laughs> just, <laughs> and I would get home from work late too because I was I was uh, working at some restaurants in the city I'd get home like really late and I'd buy a bottle of wine on my way into work because I knew I wouldn't get one afterwards because I'd get out at like two o'clock in the morning sometimes and I'd come home and I'd, I'd just turn him on and crack a bottle of wine and listen and she'd be like no 
I can't take it. But then like, I didn't, that was like 2007, 2008. And then I just, we started opening businesses and for, you know, a solid like 10 years, I was just hustling and not, no social media, no time for YouTube or Netflix or anything mm -hmm. like that. And a friend of mine uh, sent me a Simon Sinek video. Are you familiar with him as well? Yep, yep. Yeah, so they sent me the one, the, the TED talk he did about, uh, you know, know your why and the three mm -hmm. different levels and stuff. And it was really fascinating. I was like, wow, that's great. I watched the whole thing. It was the first time I'd sat down and watched a YouTube video in like, you know, in a long, <laughs> long time. We had just had our third child. So like, I kind of was like chilling with the baby a little bit. So I was like, I had some downtime. And then the feed was Gary Vaynerchuk. Like right after that Simon yep. Sinek video, I was like, oh my God, it had been 10 years. I was like, what's this dude up to? And I clicked it and I was just like, what, <laughs> what has transpired here? What, and, and then, that, but in that video, that very video, he was like, you want to expand your, your network and your web, you know, like start a podcast, invite them on. Like, who's going to say no? Like people love, you know, a podcast. And then just a couple of months later, you know, Sam here, the, the executive producer at Talking Alternative Broadcast, was like, hey, you want to host a show? Like, ooh, there we go. So it's serendipity and, and it's exactly the way you and I have mm -hmm. connected, right? Like same thing, get hard on social, get hard on LinkedIn. I start doing LinkedIn. I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but like, pa, 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 pa. And then I post a picture about jujitsu. You post a picture about jujitsu. Like, oh, you're a podcast host? Oh, I'm a podcast host. <laughs> and then yeah, like, yeah. yeah, you know, we sail off into the sunset. It's really beautiful. <laughs> I think that's how we actually connected initially. Like somebody mm -hmm. said, what are you doing this weekend? And you're like, oh, I do jujitsu every day. I was like, yeah, I wish I could do it every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah but I, I wish right now I could do it every day, but I, I'm keeping up. I'm staying pretty staying pretty sharp we'll get to that in the in the next uh in the next portion we got a couple minutes left here in our first one um there was something else i wanted to ask you about you mentioned uh, so social media your your main presence is on linkedin correct that is my main most presence, of your time yeah. tell I us spend, a little bit about that and why you have two minutes i spend i spend most of my time on linkedin uh because initially i just wanted to drive traffic to my audience right mm -hmm. um and for me i'm looking for the technology professional um, and Not finding a them on C-level right? director. And those people are hard to find on Facebook. Yeah. And plus Facebook, I find is such a negative place, at least for me. I, I haven't really spent much time on it in general, but um, I'm there mostly because that's where the, the target market I, I'm looking for is. Mm -hmm. I'm slowly trying to expand and see if I can take, you know, what I have at LinkedIn and if I can transition some of that content and some of that format into other platforms. So I've been messing with Instagram. I've been messing with, with Twitter um, and TikTok, which I still don't, I'm not really sure what to do there. Well, <laughs> um, it might be all for not anyways. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. With all the news that's coming out, it might be gone. Maybe I have to figure yeah. out Triller. But I feel like once, you know, it's like the Gary Vanderchuk thing. He says, once you get that plate spinning mm -hmm. in one spot, then you can start looking at other places. And I feel like I'm at that place with LinkedIn. But so, yeah, I agree. And it's, I see it starting to happen for me too. Uh, it's been slow. And, and he says that a lot too. Like you have to have patience. It's not like the, the virality aspect of it. Like I find it pretty useless, but it's like, it's just like in a restaurant, you want to acquire like one new customer a day. A new person walks through the door, you want to retain them. You want to do something to mm -hmm. make them feel welcome and make them feel like coming back. And I feel like social media is the same way. So it's like, it's you're just scooping or whatever if you're playing yeah. chess or checkers you know just like <laughs> one guy at a time you don't come in and like i got the whole board you know it's exactly. like i got this guy and, and then it flew out and i got that guy the great thing about social media is i've, I've found in times that people are passive you know consuming your content they might not like it or comment on it but you'll run into somebody oh, yeah. I, i've run into people i actually know because initially linkedin i was connected to only people i knew mm -hmm. they're like hey i really liked your piece of content on xyz and i was like i didn't even know you looked at that right no. <laughs> Same. <laughs> but, Same. so i mean the vanity metrics are there but i've always tell people don't don't rely yeah. on those um you know people are consuming your content they're yeah. just not letting you know that they're doing it right Cool. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in about one and a half minutes and we'll pick up with the jujitsu. Awesome. awesome, everybody. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Hang tight. Okay, everybody. Welcome back again. It's Friday, the 12 to one o'clock hour time for the Entrepreneurial Web. Set yourself up for success this week. First half of the show, we are zooming to DC talking with Nick Lozano. He is a podcast host and producer, as well as a technology consultant. But not only that, he's a five-year uh, jiu-jitsu practitioner. Prior to that, spent some time in Muay Thai and striking arts. 
and we were just discussing, we went over his kind of his background in business. And for this portion here, we're going to talk about the application of fitness in particular martial arts on how to be a better person and how that will affect your, your business and your income ultimately. So Nick, a couple of things were said in that last segment that already, they really lent themselves towards it. Once we, we were talking about chess <laughs> in terms of social media and like, and, and jujitsu is known as, uh, as human chess, it's dynamic problem solving and it's, it's placement and it's strategy, uh, really, really a mental, again, the, the, the training is mainly mental. And then the other thing that was said, you were talking about, um, your, your podcast with your, with your co-host mm -hmm. and, and the aspects of leadership that you're stressing and it's the soft skills and it's the things that it's, it's, it's almost like the dichotomy in jujitsu where like, yeah, you come in and you learn techniques and you like, you learn to pass the guard, you learn to like grab the Kimura or set up the guillotine and all that. Like, that's great. But like, that's only, that's just like the surface level part of it. There's so many other aspects mentally and the things that you have to do, like your breathing is a huge portion of it. If you cannot control your breathing, it is unlikely you are going to be a successful jujitsu practitioner. And so when you said that, it just immediately, I went to, to jujitsu. I just started thinking about it immediately. <laughs> and that training, like if you're stuck under a guy that's bigger than you and stronger than you, um, especially if he's a lower rank than you and you're not, it's like hard to get out. You're not going to get out with your ego. You're not going to be like, oh, I learned this and da, 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 da. It's like, it's patience, it's breathing, it's looking for those opportunities. Um, so we kind of connected the dots already, which is great. You know, we just say, well, our work is done. <laughs> Short show today, guys. No, have a great weekend. I'm kidding. Um, but so tell everybody a little bit about your 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 history now with martial arts. Yeah. So uh, I think my fascination with martial arts started just by seeing uh, you know Bruce Lee movies. Like I'm sure a lot of yep. us martial artists, it's you, you just latch on and you, you see him and you hear his philosophy because he was a philosophy major too. And he was just mm -hmm. kind of like the father of mixed martial arts. Um, and that always drove my interest into it. But growing up as, as a kid, I was always a team sport player. Mostly, you know, I played hockey when I was a kid and then I got out of school and I got big into running and I did running, but then I went to a striking art. Um, I initially went to go do judo. Um, so I was just at this place when I was living in Florida and these guys were, were just manhandling people and they were Olympic alternates on the USA judo team. And you just touch them and you can feel that energy. Do you know what I'm talking about? When, it, when you run into a good judo player and you can just feel the energy in their hands and I'm, you just go over the top instantly. Um, so then as I was leaving that class, that first one that I did, the Muay Thai guys were coming in. <laughs> and I was like, Hey, let me give that a try. And instantly I wasn't being a thrown around. So I, I just kind of latched onto that. I really liked hitting the pads. Um, there was something about stress relief with that and mm. it just being a really tough workout. It's a different kind of conditioning, you know, yeah. than running. It's that, you know, that fast twitch muscles being able to work in short burst. And I did that for probably four or five years. And I competed on the local scene. It's not really amateur. It's like, you know, there's another, uh, gym somewhere and they're like, Hey, we're getting together. You know, yeah. do you guys want to do something? So it's nothing really formal. And this is before the UFC was huge. Um, so it was just kind of us going around. And then once I finished college and I left Florida, uh, I moved up to DC and I just got huge into triathlon for some reason. Uh, I, I don't know why there's just something about that mental, it's that same mental grit, you know, where you're just like, you force your body to do something. It, it tells you it wants to quit, but you, you, in your mind, tell it to shut up and to keep doing something. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and then after a while, I just got tired of that, you know, running and cycling. And I just wanted to get back into having that community, that, that sense of community that you get with martial arts. So 100%. I was like, you know, yeah. I, I didn't really want to do any striking arts anymore after everything you see with head injuries coming out and all that. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I'm in my, at that time I was in my early thirties. I'm like, the last thing I need to do, be doing is getting hit in the head. Um, so I went and I did jujitsu um, and I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the community, um, how helpful everybody is. Um, to me, the sense of community in that was a bit better than when I was in uh, Muay Thai where people are yeah. trying to hurt each other sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, not, not always, but if you're in that MMA gym where competition levels high, people 
start low with their strikes and they get a little bit harder and a little harder and a little harder. And before you know it, you're, you're having a, a Duke at out fest. Um, and then I just hit that jujitsu and I just fell in love with it, the community and everyone's on the same level. Um, you know, men and women train. We don't care about if you're a man, woman, child, uh, your sexual orientation. If you want to train, we want to train with you. And I just really fell in love with that mentality. Yeah, me too. Same thing. It's funny that you mentioned that about um, the difference between like a striking art versus jujitsu. I once asked my uh, professor about that because we we train and teach mm -hmm. Muay Thai, kickboxing, as well as jujitsu out of the, the martial arts school. And the retention rate for jujitsu is just like exponentially higher than <laughs> Muay Thai, you know, yeah. like pe there were a couple of people that yeah. really like stayed for like years in Muay Thai, but a lot of people, they come in and do six months and then they go off and they were doing yoga or something else. And I just asked him one day, I was like, what, what do you think? I mean, he'd be, he's been at it for a long time. Like, what do you think it is about jujitsu? And he's like, the, you know, he just said the, the, the level of commitment just to like work with somebody is so much greater in mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu than it is with anything else like with striking arts you're often at a distance you know you don't get as close mm -hmm. to i mean it's just it's hugs it's let's just like an hour <laughs> of hugs and yeah and you really you really get like super intimate with them and so it, it does foster i think this this culture uh that is just so much more committed to itself and each other than than some of the other some of the other striking arts so what are some of the things that that what are some of the takeaways that you got directly uh, you know i mentioned a couple of my own at the mm -hmm. beginning of the show that that you got from martial arts and fitness in general that it really just helped you you alluded to a little bit of it with the with the um you know with the triathlon training i was actually listening to a joe rogan podcast earlier this morning and i forget the name of the guest it was a female doctor and she was talking about like ultra agers and yeah. how if you push yourself like that physically, it enhances your brain capacity because it's that's slowly degenerating over time. But that's one of the things like pushing yourself um, through that physical confrontation internally really develops the, the mental capacity greatly. Can you uh, give us any testimonies <laughs> to that? <laughs> I think for me, what martial arts has really done for me is let me kind of embrace the suck right mm. like you might be in a stressful situation and jiu-jitsu is a great thing and you you brought it up early you know that new white belt comes in and um you know maybe he's overweight and he's got 150 pounds on you and you let him pass your guard and instantly he's on top of you and you're like wait i should not have done that yeah. because <laughs> even though he doesn't know what he's doing this is going to be very this difficult sucks. to get out of this <laughs> you know i'm not yeah. a very big guy myself i'm only like 100 and you know 65 pounds so you know a, a 200 plusers on top of yeah. me is a difficult time so it learns that state you know to stop and breathe for a second realize that you're in a tough situation but you can always work yourself out of it as long as you take that second to collect yourself and realize that you're really not at the worst situation you could possibly be you still have a chance as long as you're still yeah. there you're still breathing you can still move um you still have a chance it's that being patient and you know embracing the stuff like yeah it's terrible now but it it's, it's not going to get any worse, right? The guy's already leaning on top of you. Yeah. And you can take that same mentality to business, especially right now with this economy. Like, what can we control right now? Well, we can't control COVID. We can't control other people wearing the mask. We can only control ourselves and our responses to, to those actions and realize that right now, yeah, we can't get together. But, you know, Zoom has been great. People have been connecting that way. People have been finding a way to do business online. Um, and especially from my day job, the technology leadership level, uh, people are finding it easier to get things bought into by senior leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's just this ability to kind of reframe your mind and realize the situations you might be in might be bad, but you can always work your way out and to a better situation. Yeah, it's been exactly the same for me. And I said it at the beginning of the show, if I wouldn't have had that constant training. And for me, like, the dojo is situated directly between two of my businesses, the two that I'm at the most, and they're full of headaches and I would have burned them to the ground if I wasn't <laughs> getting that. And there's also that, you know, that, that sense of like, whether you're hitting a heavy bag or you're wrestling with somebody, whatever was weighing on you heavy, where you're just like mentally, you're like, I can't work this out right now. 
you go into a one hour class and you come out and like, it's all still there, but you're yeah. just, you're just like, Haha, look at the birds. I feel so good right now. You know, you're like, I got this man. And, and then you reassess that, you know, you, you, you reinteract with that particular situation and it is it's completely different, uh, bifocals, you know, and it, and it just changes the whole, the, the view of the world. I feel that was, that was always the thing it did and for it, me. It does. Jiu-Jitsu to me always goes on to one of these things that I always give as a leadership principle to do hard things and do them together to mm -hmm. build a solid team. And when you do jujitsu, everyone who's committed, you know, long-term, not people who yeah. come in for a week and then leave, but everyone right. who's committed right. term has been to battle with each other, right? Yes. You've lost to this person. You've won to that person. You're sweating on the mats and all that hard work, doing those hard things together just builds a bond with people. Mm -hmm. Everyone who's been in the same gym for a long time, you're almost like family. Yeah. And I always tell people, take those same kind of principles that you learn on the mats or in your martial arts and bring them to business pick the hardest project you can do. And it doesn't matter if you complete it or not. It's doing those hard things together um, that help build a bond with the team. Absolutely. That's it, man. Awesome. Very, very great insights. Thank you. So we're going to have to wrap up this portion of the show. I'd like to thank you for coming on. Uh, really, really awesome stuff, man. I couldn't have you, you said it much better than I would have. <laughs> <laughs> so much better. So thank you for that. Where can people find out about you if they're trying to get in touch with you, interested in your podcast, your services, or just talking about jujitsu? Sure. So the easiest place to find me personally on social media is LinkedIn. Uh, it's just hit that LinkedIn forward slash IN forward slash N-I-C-K dash L-O-Z-A-N-O. You'll find me on there. My podcast is called lead.exe. Just looking at it in any uh, podcast catcher app, wherever you listen to them, you'll find them. Um, and like I said, I'm open on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter, uh, Nick L. Lozano. That's two L's. Um, just send me a message or anything. I'll be happy to talk to anybody about anything, martial arts, business, podcasting, whatever. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much. I'll stay in touch with you, especially through LinkedIn and ED. <laughs> 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 That's a, that's a joke from a previous show. I had a LinkedIn guest and it was just a funny thing. This, they had an accent and the way it came out was really funny. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll rehash that another time. But again, thank you for being on the show. I look forward to speaking to you soon. Everybody else, stay tuned. We're about to Zoom to Fargo, North Dakota. All right. We'll be back in just a few, everybody. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web.